Hey everybody, it's Mr. N here, and we are going to talk about antiderivatives. Now, an antiderivative is pretty much what the word means. It's the antiderivative, the opposite of the derivatives, undoing what a derivative is. So, a function f right here is called an antiderivative of f on an interval, capital F, notice here, little f. f is the antiderivative of f on an interval i if capital F prime of x equals F prime of x for all x and i. So in other words, the derivative of the original equals the antiderivative of the other one, right? So they're inverse operations, pretty much. So basically, we can have F of x and take F prime of x. So now backwards, there's just one problem. Here's the problem. Suppose if I have F of x equals 3x squared plus 4x minus 1. If I have the derivative, f prime of x, I take this, this becomes 6x plus 4. Notice the constant became 0. If I gave you this and you told me the antiderivative, the problem is how do you get the constant term? How do you find the constant term? You can't get negative 1 unless you're given more information. So here's our theorem we're going to talk about right now. If f is an antiderivative of f on a function i, then the most general antiderivative of f on i is f of x plus c. We will just say plus c, where c is going to be the constant. So now let's do some examples. And I will later tell you that we are going to learn in chapter 5, not just quite yet, we're going to learn a symbol to stand for the antiderivative, and it's going to be this symbol that looks like this. Let me put it over here. And let me draw it a little bit better. It looks like that, and I'll explain that symbol later. But this is the symbol we'll use for the antiderivative in chapter 5. So I know with this video, a lot of people are going, why aren't you using that symbol? Why aren't you saying that? And it's we also call it the integral, which... Again, in chapter 5, I will explain all that. But right now, we're just trying to find antiderivatives. And there are many ways to do antiderivatives, but one of the most basic and common ways is to guess and check. So we want to find the most general antiderivative of each of these. If this is my f of x, that means I want to find my f... Let me rephrase that. This is my f prime of x, and I want to find what my f of x was. Right? So in this case f of x is what I'm looking for. Well, I need to guess. What do I put here? When I take the derivative, I will get that. Well, remember, whenever you take the derivative, you're subtract subtracting 1. So if this is x to the first power, this has got to be x squared. But now I need something in front of here. Let's do this. If I guess and check, and I take this derivative, I'll get 2x. Is that what I want? No. I need to get rid of the number out in front, so I'll need to multiply this by one half. So f of x came out to be one half. Well, actually, I could put it as little f of x instead of capital since I'm calling this the prime. I don't need to distinguish them. Okay. Comes out to be one half x squared plus some sort of constant. Now, if you forget to put the constant, you're going to get points taken off. You need to find the constant. Okay. And put c. We can't find a value for the constant unless I'm given more information, such as in this one, where I'm given a point that it passes through. Then I can get the constant. Okay, but let's continue on with these for now. Over here. Okay, this is nothing right there. There's no x. So that means x to the 0. So that means I need x to the first power. So f of x will be something x to the first power. Okay, so now if I do this and take the derivative, remember, you're just guess and checking. If I take f of x equals this, this is my guess, for example. There's going to be other methods besides guess and check, but that's what we're going to do for now. Okay, um, f prime of x would just give me 1, so that means I need to put a 2 out in front of this. So f of x comes out to be 2 plus, don't forget, plus the c, the constant. Okay, moving on to the next one. If I do this with a guess and check method, let's let's see what we got here. Okay, over here, I need f of x. Now, it'll be something, this was squared, so I know it's going to be x cubed, minus something, 
this was to the first, so I know I'm going to need x squared. Plus something, this was 0, so I know it'll be x to the first. Okay, now let's do the guess and check thing. If I take the derivative here, I'll get 3x squared. Oh, matches, so that means that's just a 1 right here. And you don't need to write the 1 in. Okay, over here, doing it on the next one, I'll get 2x to the first, so that's just a 1. And again, this is just a 1. So I didn't need to write the 1s in plus my c. So really, I've got f of x equals x cubed minus x squared plus x plus c. All right, and let's take a look at this last one now over here. Sine x, well, hmm, what derivative gives me the sine x? Well, that's going to be cosine x, right? Cosine x will give me, that derivative will give me sine x. Sine x would give me cosine x. Cosine, oh, I need a negative out in front because it would give me negative sine x, right? If, if I took the derivative of cosine x, that would give me negative sine x, but I need a positive, so I need to put a negative out in front of here plus my c. So this is what f of x would be for this one. All right, moving on. Again, I did these with just a guess and check method. Nothing fancy here, just a simple guess and check method. Um, let's see if I can... Uh, move this up and resize it just a teeny bit right there. All right. Now for this next one, we know a point that it passes through. So let's try to do this. We know that f of x, oops, whoa, what the heck just happened here? Let's uh, go back, change my pen color. Looks like I hit a button. f of x would be, hmm. All right. This, I need to rewrite it to be negative x to the negative 2. Right? So over here, I would need, remember, we subtract 1 when we take a derivative, so this needs to be to the negative 1, something here to give me a negative x. All right? So what would that something be? It would just be that, because if I multiply negative x, take the derivative here, right, I would get negative x to the negative 2, and that's what gave me the value. So over here, f of x equals negative, or just x to the negative 1 plus c, all right, which is 1 over x plus c. But now I know a point that it passes through. When x is 2, f of x is 1. So 1 equals 1 over 2 plus c, so c will be 1 half. So my final equation is 1 over x plus the 1 half. All right, let's take a look at the next one. The way the Stewart book progresses. I haven't taught you this, but let me teach it to you right now real quick. If you have um, the natural log of a number, ln of x, the derivative f prime would be equal to 1 over x. All right, so that's what you do when you have um, something x to the negative 1 power and you're taking the antiderivative, you're going to end up with a natural log. I will teach you that further in detail as we go along in the chapters, but the way this book progresses, we haven't quite been taught, been taught that yet, So, but I'm going to still do this problem for you guys anyway. Over here, I'm going to rewrite this to be x plus 2 to the negative 1, like that, okay? So now I want my f of x, and I told you whenever you have to the negative 1 power, it's going to be this ln. So this is going to be ln of x plus 2 plus your c. Okay, that's what this one would end up being. They gave me the point negative 1, 3. So 3 ln over here, negative 1 plus 2 plus c. This gives me the ln of 1, which is 0. So c equals 3. So f of x will end up being ln x plus 2 plus 3. All right, next up, we've got the following over here. We've got the following, f of x equals 2x plus 1 minus cosine, and then we have a point. Okay, so we've got a lot of stuff going on. So f of x will be, okay, this is going to be x squared, right? If I do the guess and check and take the derivative here, I'll get 2x, perfect. Over here, it'll end up being plus x, right? You could guess and check. And then this will be minus the, oops, minus the sine, of x this time because the derivative of sine gives me cosine. Remember, we're doing antiderivatives. So I'm guessing something, taking a derivative and see if it matches. That's pretty much the method that I'm using 
in this section. We'll learn more as time goes on. Okay, I'm going to put in my point 3, and this is 0 squared plus 0 minus the sine of 0 plus c, c equals 3. So f of x equals x squared plus x minus sine x plus 3. There you go. All right, let's do this next one. Over here, this time I'm given a second derivative. Ooh, crazy, second derivative. Okay, process is the same. We can go through and find the first derivative by taking the antiderivative. So this is squared. I need x cubed. What times x cubed right here would give me 12? It would be 4. Plus, this is 0, so it would be x to the first, and I would need a 6 out in front of it, plus my first constant. All right, I'm given that f prime of 0 is 2. So when I put in the derivative 0, I get 2. So 2 equals 4 times 0 cubed plus 6 times 0 plus c. So over here, c equals 2. So now let's write this over here. I've got f prime of x equaling 4x cubed plus 6x plus my 2. Now, f of x, take the antiderivative again. This will be x to the fourth. Notice, oh, that worked out great. It's just a 1. Plus, this will be x squared. Okay, so 2 times what right here would give me a 6? That would have to be a 3. Plus 2x plus c. So there it is. And I'm told that when I plug in 0, I get 1. So 1 equals 0 to the fourth plus 3 times 0 squared plus 2 times 0 plus c. c equals 1. And now I can express my final result here, which would be f of x equals this x to the fourth plus 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. And there you go. All right, let's move on. Let's do a few more problems. Over here, this deals with uh, rectilinear motion using antiderivatives. All right, on this first one, it says find the velocity, and let's see what we got here. And position functions of a body falling freely from a height of zero meters under each of the following conditions. For part A, it says acceleration is 9.8 meters per second and falls from rest, so we need to find the velocity and the position. So for part A, if this is my acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared, so that means my velocity will be the antiderivative of this acceleration. So that would just be 9.8x, or we'll say t since we're using v of t, plus some constant. Well, it says it uh, falls freely uh, from a height of 0 meters under each of the, and it falls from rest. So the initial velocity was 0. So at time equals 0, the velocity was 0. At t equals 0, v of t equals 0 because it started from rest. So c is 0 in this case. So v of t is just 9.8t. Okay. Now, acceleration, or sorry, position. Our position is going to be the antiderivative of the velocity. So that'll be, well, I need t squared, so that'll make that 4.9 plus some sort of constant. And it says from a height of 0 meters, uh, it falls from rest. So at t equals 0, it's 0 also. So t equals 0, s of t equals 0. So that means s of t is just 4.9t squared. All right, for part B, the body is propelled downward this time with an initial velocity. So this is at t equals 0, my v of t equals 1. So over here, I will get the same situation um, since my acceleration, a of t, is 9.8 meters per second squared. My v of t will be 9.8 t plus c, which is the antiderivative. But this time I have an initial condition. I know that... Uh, T, when t is 0, v of t is 1. So this becomes 9.8 times 0 plus c, which gives me a value of c being 1. So v of t will be 9.8t plus 1. There's my velocity equation. Now for acceleration, or for, I'm sorry, for position, I will get my 4.9t squared plus t plus c, right? I took the antiderivative of this. 
and at t equals 0, I still have a position of 0. s of 0 is 0, so that hasn't changed. This one, this will be 4.9 t squared plus t. All right, let's move on to the next question here. All right, a bus has stopped to pick up riders and a woman's running constant velocity 5 meters per second to catch it. When she is 11 meters behind the front door, the bus pulls away with a constant acceleration of 1 meters per second. Okay, so we've got our situation here. We've got a bus. We've got a woman running after it, right? Here she is. Here's our bus. And the bus, She when she is 11 meters behind the front door, okay, so this is 11 She's 11 meters. The bus pulls away with a constant acceleration. Acceleration of the bus is 1 meter per second squared. And she is running. The velocity of the woman is um, 5 meters per second. And from that point, how long will it take for the woman to reach the front door if she keeps running with a velocity of 5? Okay. So those are all the things we know. We know her velocity. We know the distance, and we know the bus's acceleration. Okay, so the woman needs to travel um, after t seconds, 11 plus whatever the bus moves. All right, so she, woman needs to travel 11 plus whatever the bus, the distance, we'll say the distance the bus moves. Okay, that's what she needs to travel. So her position, the position of the woman at some time t is going to be 11 plus the position of the bus. Okay, that's the easiest way to kind of explain that. Um, we know her velocity and we know the bus's acceleration. So here's what we're going to do with this. We're going to take her velocity, take the antiderivative to get the position. So the position of the woman will be 5t plus c, but c is going to be 0 because we're saying that she's at 0 right there, her initial position, and then she's got to travel the 11, right? So s of w, sw of t is just going to be 5t. So we'll put that in here, 5t equals 11 plus the position of the bus at time t. Well, we don't know what the position of that bus is, right? But we do know an acceleration of the bus. So let me choose a different color here. And we know the acceleration of the bus is one meter per second. So the velocity of the bus at time t is going to be t plus c. Well, again, the velocity at zero is going to be zero, right? Because the bus at time equals zero, the bus hasn't started to move yet. As the time starts, then the bus starts to accelerate. So in this case, c is zero. So we have a velocity of the bus at time t as being t. Well, let's take the position of the bus. Okay, we'll take the antiderivative of that. s of b of t is going to be, well, this will be t squared, so I need a one-half out in front, plus c. But in regards to the position of the bus, she's got to go this 11. So the bus will be 0, and that's where that 11 will be taken into account. So the position of the bus at time equals 0 will be 0. Okay, So that means s of b will be 1 half t squared. I can't use the 11 twice. right? I've already used it here that she's got to go this distance of 11. So if I used her, I could have said right here, 0, and then add the 11 in, but I've already put it into my equation. So it's already taken into account. So that's why the bus's position is 0 as well. So now, putting all this together into my equations, I will get 5t equals 11 plus 1 half t squared. So now I can put this all together and say 1 half t squared minus 5t plus 11 equals 0, and solve this, and I will get t equals 
3.3 seconds, and I'll also get or 6.7 seconds. So there's two spots. Um, she's running pretty fast. She can actually pass the bus, and then the bus will catch up to her again. So there's two places where she can catch up to the bus, and that's what that means. All right, let's look at this final example over here. Given that a of t, or a equals t squared plus 2t, uh, when s is 1, to find v of t and s of t. Okay, so we have the acceleration, and we need to find the velocity and the position. So we'll take these, this antiderivative right here, and we'll start with that. So we're going to take the antiderivative of this one, and I should have probably put a of t right here. So v of t will be, okay, this will be t cubed, so I'll need a one-third out in front, plus this will be a t squared, and when I take the ant, uh, derivative, it matches up, I'm good, plus the c. So now, here's what they tell me, though. We have um, uh, at t equals 0 and t equals 2, I have two different positions. Uh-oh, I can't do anything here. So I'm just going to call this my first constant, c1. Because I don't have any information that I can plug in to find it. But what I can do now is I can find my position by taking the antiderivative here. And this will be t to the fourth. And I have the one-third out in front. And I need another one-fourth out here. right? I already have this one-third. I need a one-fourth to get rid of that. So that's going to be one-twelfth t to the fourth. Plus over here, this will be t cubed. So I'll need a one-third plus one-third t cubed, plus c1 times t, plus my second constant, and this is my s of t over here. But now I'm given some info. I know that when s is 1, t equals 0. So when s is 1 at t equals 0, I could put that in, plus 1 third t equals 0 cubed, plus c1 t equals 0, right? So that gives me a value of C2, which is 1. Boom. Okay, so now I have my S of t equaling 1 12th t to the 4th, or this is C2, sorry, uh, plus 1 third t cubed plus C1t plus 1. All right, but then I know something else here. I know that S is negative 3 when t is 2. When t is 2, S is negative 3, and this is 1 12th, and here I'll have 2 to the 4th, plus 1 third, 2 cubed, plus c1 times 2 plus 1. And I work all of this out, and I'll get c1 equaling negative 4. All right, so that's what I end up with c1. I have c2, so my final equation will be 1 12th t to the 4th plus one third t cubed plus, or I should say minus four t plus one. There's my position. If I wanted to plug this in and get what my velocity was, this would be one third t cubed uh, plus t squared minus four. There would be my velocity. All right, so that's the antiderivative and its applications. Uh, there's going to be a lot more applications for the antiderivative, but that's just the basics of it. Um, again, we'll do way more of this in the next chapter. So thanks for watching. Hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll see you guys in the next video.